Okay, so here we have the uh, dissected cat, and we're looking specifically at a couple of lymphoid structures in this specimen. Okay, so what we see peeking out here from the lateral abdominal wall is the spleen. Okay, so this is how the spleen would look in the cat, and we can't actually see the whole spleen here. Uh, if we dug around a little bit, we'd see that there's a piece of it extending uh, posteriorly here. And in some cats, it's a little more anterior, and others, it's like it is here. And this happens to be a fairly small spleen. Sometimes you see humongous spleens in these cats. Okay, and you can see part of it uh, sticking out. It's always going to have this kind of uh, brick red color associated with it. It's always going to be about in this location. In humans, you can think of the spleen as being about the size of your fist and tucked right under your costal border on the left. Okay? All right, we'll move up to the thoracic cavity. The organ that you see right here is kind of extending uh, from the anterior neck down to the base of the heart is the thymus. Okay, and that was uh, the primary lymphoid organ for T cells that we talked about earlier. Then we have right here another secondary lymphoid organ, which is a lymph node. Okay, this is kind of a small one. Okay, but it's very common to see lymph nodes in the anterior chest as well as in the abdominal pelvic cavity and a lot of times when we're dissecting the muscles in AMP1 we'll see one in the popliteal fossa. Okay, now the lymph nodes are filtering the lymph okay and um, the lymph is picked up by lymphatic capillaries in um, the tissues. It starts out as interstitial fluid when it moves into the um, lymphatic capillaries, that's when we start to call it lymph. And then it moves on to lymphatic collecting vessels, which are a little bit larger. And then maybe through a lymph node or two, and then into lymphatic trunks. And all the lymphatic trunks in the body drain into the two largest lymphatic vessels, which are the lymphatic ducts. We usually don't see a good example of the lymphatic duct on the right, but it is pretty common to see a good example of the one on the left. And you can actually see it here with the, the pin in it. And that is the thoracic duct. Okay, so the thoracic duct, its inferior end is going to be in the abdominal cavity. It has a big swelling there called the cisterna chile. It then uh, proceeds, uh, if you can follow, you can follow it up from there if you dissect it through the diaphragm. Uh, it's basically right next to the aorta. And I'm actually holding the aorta back so you can see the thoracic duct here. Okay? A lot of times the duct will have um, it'll look like it's pinched in multiple locations that's because there's so many valves in it okay so it has lots of valves to prevent backflow like a lot of our systemic veins do in the limbs okay so the thoracic duct continues up here it's not quite as uh, developed up here you can see a little bit of it here as well. and See how there's some blue in it here? A lot of times uh, you'll see blue in it because since it's attached to the venous system, sometimes the blue of the vein will um, kind of backtrack through the initial part of the uh, thoracic duct. Okay, and remember that the thoracic duct uh, in humans, always attaches to the intersection of the left subclavian vein and the left internal jugular vein.
Okay, so basically it would be attached about right here where I'm pushing the probe. Okay, now in addition to B cells, we also have the T cells in the body. The T cells, there are two types uh, that are in this illustration. Uh, the one that is in the first illustration here is the um, helper T cell. And helper T cells are a type of T cell that are very important for kind of controlling the immune response, the adaptive immune response. Okay, so the helper T cell, uh, even though we think of the T cell mediated immunity as a cell mediated immunity, the helper T cell isn't the one that's going to go out and really kill any cells. This is the one that is going to become activated and then basically control the rest of the adaptive immune response. And T cells have to bind to a type of receptor uh, that is going, or use a type of receptor, excuse me, that has two binding sites associated with it. Okay, so there's one binding site here that's going to look at what's being displayed by a cell. That's what this red component is here. And then they're going to have another section that's going to look at the chemical signature on this protein itself, not what's being displayed. Okay, so we're always looking at self through this kind of squiggly component. And then we're looking at what's being displayed to see if that chemical signature matches what we're seeing here as self. Okay, if this helper T cell was coming to this macrophage and binding and this red material matched the chemical signature of the self here that it's recognizing with the squiggly CD4 co-receptor, then everything's good. If these two match, then this helper T cell is just going to go away and, and be happy. If they don't match, if this looks normal, but this looks abnormal, then the helper T cell will become activated. Okay, and it will be able to interact with any other cell in the body that's been activated by this same abnormal signature. Okay, so a B cell that's been activated could be stimulated by this helper T cell or another type of T cell that's been activated could be stimulated by this helper T cell. Okay, so none of these other cells will ever be able to work up to their full potential unless this helper T cell comes and gives them the stimulation that they need. Okay, now the cytotoxic T cells, which are, this is an example of one here, are the ones that are actually going out into the body and eliminating abnormal cells. So this yellow cell here is a cancerous cell, a malignant cell. And you can see that this uh, cytotoxic T cell is really getting invasive with it. It's got little uh, pseudopods that it's extending. It's really getting aggressive here. Okay, so it has recognized that this cell is displaying abnormal proteins on its surface. Okay, and cytotoxic T cells will interact with the self antigens of the MHC1 category and every nucleated body cell has these uh, self antigens associated with them. And if they're displaying normal cellular proteins, 
then the cytotoxic T cell won't be activated, just like we talked about up here. If it's normal, normal, or matching at both places, the T cell is not going to be activated. If it looks and one chemical signature looks different from the other, that's what's going to activate the T cell. Okay, so this cell, if it's the cytotoxic T cell that's activated, it's going to directly take steps to destroy the cell that activated it. Okay, so it will release chemicals involved in what's called the lethal hit. I love that name. Okay, so granzymes and perforins are the two main types of chemicals that will be released by these cytotoxic T cells. Perforins do just what they sound like. They perforate or poke holes in the membrane. Okay, so they act similar to the way complement acts. Okay, they form stable pores in the membrane of the cell. Okay, and then the granzymes, the end of the name is telling you what it is. It's a set of enzymes, very potent hydrolytic enzymes. Okay, and these enzymes will basically enter the cell through the pore and digest it from the inside out.